Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heart failure. So in this next video, we're going to discuss how valvulopathies can lead to heart failure. So of course, there are four heart valves, the aortic valve here, the mitral valve here, the pulmonary valve here, and the tricuspid valve here. Now, as people get older, these valves become diseased, and there are two main ways in which they become diseased. There are others, but those are far, far rarer. So we'll talk about the main diseases that occur naturally with old age, and these are calcifications, so the valves become calcified, and degeneration, so they can degenerate. So calcification usually affects predominantly the aortic valves and the mitral valves, and all it literally means is that calcium is gradually laid down, becomes deposited within the tissue of the valve, and that turns it from being, you know, versatile and mobile and uh, flexible to being a very rigid structure, not as mobile. Degeneration literally just means the valves become smaller, and of course that's going to mean that they're not able to actually uh, close the gap anymore. And let's just remind ourselves of the basics. What is the purpose of the valves? The valves is are there to make sure that flow occurs in only one way, to try and prevent you from getting back flow. So for each of the valves, there are two major things that can go wrong. They can either become stenotic, where they no longer allow blood to move through properly, or they can start to regurgitate. And these two processes, calcification, can lead to both stenosis and regurgitation. Degeneration is mainly going to lead to regurgitation. So let's just write a little bit of this down. So for each valve, you can suffer with stenosis, so aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, Pulmonary and tricuspid stenosis are not very common whatsoever. You'll never actually hear about those. Aortic stenosis is the main one. Mitral stenosis is another important one that can occur. Then regurgitation. So aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation, and tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, so of those, the most important ones are aortic regurgitation, AR, mitral regurgitation, and then tricuspid regurgitation. You don't hear much about pulmonary regurgitation. And of stenosis, the two main ones are aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis, obviously not to be confused with multiple sclerosis. So again, just a reminder of what this means. Stenosis means that the valve is now no longer able to open properly. So remember, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to be like this when closed and like this when open. What if the valve becomes stiff and now can only open that much? So it can't get into this position anymore. It can only go from that position to this position now. What could cause that to happen? Well, calcification. If what these valve leaflets become calcified, then they become rigid, then they're nowhere near as mobile. Maybe they're not able to move as much anymore. Uh, so that can lead to this phenomenon where they're not able to open enough anymore. So calcification can cause this. And of course now, that opening is much, much smaller. So blood is going to have a much, much more difficult time moving through there. That is what we mean by valvular stenosis. And as I say, the main two valves that become calcified are the aortic valve and the mitral valve. The pulmonary valve and the um, tricuspid valve don't tend to become calcified. You see this, by the way, on CT scans. Loads of people get CT chests, and you can see the calcification of the valves, and the valves that you nearly always see that are calcified are the aortic valve and the mitral valve, because calcium shows up on CT bright white. Um, so calcification then can lead to stenosis, and the main two valves that get stenosed are the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Why is it the aortic and the mitral valve that gets to, that get calcified rather than the uh, right-sided valves? Well, it's thought that one of the major risk factors for calcification of the valves is high pressures. And of course, the pressures are naturally much higher in the left heart than the right heart, and that's thought to be the reason that these valves and become calcified, and these ones don't. So in particular, risk factor for aortic stenosis is high 
blood pressure, essential hypertension, because that means that the pressure that the aortic valve is exposed to is even higher, which promotes this calcification of the aortic valve, leading to aortic stenosis. Now, regurgitation. How does regurgitation occur? Well, there's two possibilities. Maybe the valve can no longer close completely. So what if the calcification is so bad that it immobilizes the valve so much that it can't even close properly anymore? Let's say it can only now go to like, oh, that's not a very good picture. Let's say it can only go to this, okay? So these valves are now leaflets are so immobilized by calcification that they can only move a tiny bit. So they can move a tiny bit to open, but then they can only move a tiny bit to close and therefore they can't actually close completely anymore. That's one thing that can lead to the gaps still being open during diastole and therefore uh, allowing blood to regurgitate backwards. So calcification can lead to regurgitation. Uh, so that might lead to regurgitation of the aortic valve or the mitral valve. As I'm saying, as I've already said, the aortic and the mitral valve are the main two that are affected by calcification. So this might be what leads to someone developing aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. So you can have both aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation from calcification of the aortic valve. Likewise, you can have mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation from calcification of the aortic valve. Degeneration then can also lead to a uh, regurgitation of the valves. So what if the leaflets have become too small now? What if they're like that? Uh, then, of course, there's no hope for them. They can't close that gap. So, of course, you're going to get regurgitation. That's probably a bit too much of an extreme example. I think you'd have horrific regurgitation if it was like that. Um, but you get the picture. If the valves get leaflets get smaller because of degeneration, you're now no longer going to be able to close the gap with those uh, leaflets and therefore you will get regurgitation and degeneration usually the mitral valve can be affected by degeneration and the tricuspid valve can be affected by regurgitation so common uh, degeneration so commonly mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation will occur because of degeneration of the valve leaflets so those are the two pathological processes that can occur to the valve leaflets, and these are the main consequences. The pulmonary valve usually doesn't get problems. Uh, so pulm significant pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary regurgitation is very uncommon. Now, and, that, and or when it does occur, it's usually, uh, you know, her, uh, it's usually congenital, so it's usually a problem in paediatrics. Now, I am not an expert whatsoever on paediatrics. I know very little about congenital heart diseases, uh, so I'm not even going to touch on that topic. Um, so we're going to affect, we're going to focus on the ones that occur with old age, which I know far more about. So let's now discuss how these things here, aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, and tricuspid regurgitation, how those, if they got really bad, could lead to heart failure. So let's begin with aortic stenosis. So stenosis of the aortic valve. So the left ventricle is now just not able to pump against that stenotic aortic valve as well. So that's what's going to lead to reduced cardiac output and therefore heart failure. And that's an example of left heart failure because the pathology is on the left-hand side. And that, as we discussed in the previous video, may well lead to uh, pulmonary edema. Mitral stenosis. So if we've got stenosis now of the mitral valve, the left atrium is not going to be able to move that blood into the left ventricle and therefore it's going to s reduce cardiac output because less blood's flowing through that bit, so less blood's going to be flowing through that entire system. And again, that's an example of left heart failure because the pathology is on the left-hand side, and again, that could lead to pulmonary edema. Aortic regurgitation. So now the left ventricle is finding it nice and easy. Let's say aortic regurgitation just because of degeneration. So it's not we aortic regurgitation in the absence of aortic stenosis. So the left ventricle is pumping the blood out absolutely fine, but then a whole bunch of the blood is coming back in. Again, that means that overall the net flow is reduced. So again, cardiac output is reduced, heart failure. Mitral regurgitation, again, the blood's flowing back that way. Another example of left heart failure, uh, and which could lead to um, pulmonary edema. Tricuspid regurgitation, the left, uh, the left atrium's moving the blood into the left ventricle, but then when the left ventricle contracts, blood's going to be pushed back into the left 
atrium now, again, that means that there's less blood going up the pulmonary trunk, so cardiac output's going to be reduced. So that would be an example then of right heart failure, and that would not typically lead to pulmonary edema. So all of these processes are going to reduce cardiac output and therefore lead to heart failure. But again, note this point that this doesn't necessarily have to be associated with cardiomyopathy. The muscles might be absolutely fine. As we'll discuss in the next video when we come on to cardiomyopathy, lots of these different diseases that we've already discussed can lead to cardiomyopathy, but it's not necessarily the case that you have to have cardiomyopathy for them to be causing heart failure. And if they are causing heart failure and you do not yet have cardiomyopathy, then your heart failure will be curable if you just fix the valve. So if you replace whichever valve it is that is broken, then you might be able to completely fix that person's heart failure. So, covered valvulopathies now, let's have a break and in the next video we will talk finally about cardiomyopathy uh, and we will put to bed at last this um, major confusion uh, between heart failure and cardiomyopathy.